products. Good morning, everyone. I realize that uh, probably 50 to 70% of you are still somewhat hungover from last night. And I know this is the first talk of the day, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to uh, come out and, uh, and uh, see the, uh, my presentation. So my name is uh, John Jones, and I have uh, spent the majority of my career working remotely, and I've learned a lot of things through trial and error and uh, mistakes I've made, uh, successes I've seen in others, and I've um, been writing and speaking for years on the subject of uh, how, to, well, how to be a really effective remote worker, contractor, freelancer, and essentially just helping I, I learn as I go, and I, I'm very honest about uh, what I've learned, my mistakes, my successes, and I like relaying that to other people so they can get to the same point where I feel I am in my career, where I can I have more choice and control over what I do, how I do it, and get to, most importantly, live where I want instead of not having to move everywhere. So hopefully this presentation will give all of you an idea of some of the tips and techniques you can use to, um, to start working remotely, whether you're working full-time, um, uh, working for full time doing so uh, and want to keep doing that for your existing employer or if you want to make a complete break and uh, go into the exciting world and stressful world of freelancing. So first off, um, I have 16 years uh, in game development, nine of it is remote. I've worked on over 50 titles. My specialization is as an outsourcing manager, as a freelancer, which to my knowledge, nobody else does. And I've been doing that since uh, 2009. And I've been uh, building and managing remote teams of anywhere from five to 75 people for a variety of clients and employers, including Epic Games, Avalanche Studios, 2K Games, NCSoft, Sony Online Entertainment, et cetera. So I've had a lot of experience at studios, I mean, both large and small, all kinds of tool sets. And all that began because uh, in 2008 and 2009, I was laid off twice in one year. And I was at the point of, forget this. <laughs> and I uh, decided, OK, I'm going to take more control over this. I'm not going to be beholden to one boss anymore. Um, didn't, it bothered me a little bit that technically there's no such thing as a freelance outsourcing manager, but I lived in Austin, it was cheap enough to live off unemployment and uh, severance, so I figured I'd make a go of it. Uh, eight years later, I'm living in Brooklyn and doing the same thing. So, cutting the tether. Much has been written about uh, the tools, the philosophy, the home setups, uh, you know, what hardware to buy, uh, what attitudes to have, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do that. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not here to repeat those. And frankly, I've, I've done several talks on them as well. Um, on my website, I've had other talk um, have presentations and articles on specifically what hardware to buy. Um, if you want to be an independent content developer on like the Unity Asset Store, the Unreal Engine Marketplace, which I used to run, I have an article on that. I don't want to retread that. I want to go into the nitty gritty details that I haven't heard other people talk about before in hopes that some of this will stick. So ask yourself, what do you really want to do? Do you want to do the same job as now, only doing it from home, just transition into being a, I mean, someone that works full time from home with your current, uh, current employer? Do you want to freelance from contract to contract? Or is your ultimate dream to develop your own game and just pay the bills by freelancing and, until you're in a position where your game is released and that can be your full time thing? So scenario one is doing the same job from home. When in your heart of hearts, you really just want to spend more time with your cats and wearing shorts. So but the sad truth of this is sometimes organizations simply will not allow remote work and there's only so much you can do I mean, like within those parameters. Sometimes it may, may be a non-starter, uh, but it's, it's still worth feeling out. And uh, I'm going to go into some um, t tips and techniques for uh, how to negotiate that and earn your way into doing so. So um, typically speaking, management by walking around and seeing uh, is the norm, like seeing people at their desks and um, speaking from like the management producer level on down. Like, okay, all these desks are full. It looks like they're uh, working the applications I expect. Okay, so scenario one, the same job from home. Uh, so management by walking around is the norm. And if I mean, it's essentially a producer or manager walking around saying, okay, this person is at their desk, this person isn't. It, this seems their applications, uh, the appropriate applications are open. I can sit down and have a quick casual conversation if I need to. It's a lot easier to just casually encounter someone I mean, walking around in the workplace and get a, a general sense of what's going on and to be able to have a specific request I mean, for them uh, doing so. It's, uh, some managers prefer I mean, being able to see people physically face 
face-to-face. -face. Others prefer um, doing all of it, uh, you know, digitally, either through you know Hangouts or Slack or even SMS. I've had some bosses, which is strange. So for people that I mean, uh, managers that prefer walking around, their ability to control their environment and feel confident in what they're doing involves uh, see, being able to see people, being able to speak to them, and be able to observe them physically. And so in, like in the worst possible case for them, remote work is a loss of their control. So you have, to do, you have to go out of your way to increase your presence remotely and make it easier for them to feel comfortable knowing what you're doing and to have you be a predictable component of development. Uh, this is a way to alleviate anxiety uh, in, in a boss, which is, generally speaking, a really good thing. So fortunately, a lot of these techniques for increasing, uh, increasing your productivity, increasing your liability and presence um, uh, can be practiced on site. For example, projecting yourself remotely is the biggest thing you can do as a remote worker to be able to increase confidence, not only in your bosses, uh, but also in your team, so they can know that you're someone reliable that can be assigned work and they know what you're going to do and where to expect it. So your job is to be where they look first. What are their basic expectations in the day-to-day -day workflow? Uh, some people use Slack, some people have internal messaging systems, uh, some people have like, a, like, an in, like an internal forum or uh, like Basecamp, Shotgun, something like that. Uh, just find out where that expectation is and focus your efforts on being visible there because you have to actively participate and actively make your presence known uh, far above average than you would if you're working in house. And that's a really, that's a large hump to get over. So while you're still working at a studio, you can try and increase your presence digitally to find out how to get people's attention when you can't simply walk over to their desk. You have to always actively compensate for being out of sight. So there are a lot of ways you can challenge yourself. Um, to be able to get answers if you're not physically there, even though, uh, even though you still are. For example, which coworkers ignore email instant messaging? Who's always texting? That could be one way to reach people. If source control is down, where else is uh, uh, just, uh, the information you need to live? Is it somewhere on the server? Is it uh, like backed up on Dropbox somewhere? Do you have access to that? And can you get it? These are the things you have to seek out and think about when you work remotely, because I mean, if you're you know, 30, 30 minutes to an hour away from the office and you have no other way to access it except physically, you should have planned better. And another situation, if it's late and you need help and you know from being in the office who always stays late, that person's a potential resource. You have to constantly challenge yourself to try and find out how would I seek these things out if I didn't have physical access to the facility and what do I need to have access to at, the, at this studio for me to be productive even if no one else is around. You have to learn to be extremely self-sufficient and no one will really teach you that. Just in, in a way this is like the build up to being able to ask if you can work remotely which I will get to but always challenge yourself and pose interesting problems uh, to yourself to try to solve. You also have to accept greater responsibility. So when you're working remotely, you're responsible for your own hardware, storage, connectivity, a high rate of responsiveness, and consistent productivity. So the, I bring up productivity in particular because it's the best thing you can do if you're working offsite to maintain confidence in your team and, um, and in your bosses is to be a consistent, reliable resource. I'd uh, think of it as a marathon instead of a sprint. I'd rather someone that was about 90%, you know, 90% productive every day consistently so I know what to expect of them instead of one day they're an incredible performer, the next day they're barely there, uh, and then the next day they're an incredible performer again. The more you can be a component they don't have to actively have to think about, the more valuable you are to the company. And a lot of that is how you're able to project yourself remotely and be where they, be where they look first and what they expect of you. So I, I see this, if, so if you're working for someone full time, I see earning your way up to being, uh, to being able to work remotely as um, the end point of a campaign. You have to start in the beginning. So you have to lay the groundwork to increase your perceived value internally and externally. So step it up at work and perform better than ever and show that you can sustain that over time. Like I said before, if you can be a solid 90% uh, productivity every day instead of I mean, fluctuating I mean, quite a bit, that will build a lot of trust uh, in that environment. You have to increase your mastery of the tools and technology and understand what, it, uh, what you need to be able to get the job done either on-site or off-site and showing that kind of technical mastery very much unlike what I did in trying to get this up on the screen. Uh, that can be a huge confidence builder and help build a case for, um, for you being able to work remotely. 
Also, write about what you do. Write about your craft. Blog, publish, get, um, get involved in online forums. Like work on creating a credible name for yourself and, he and help other people in doing so. Basically, the more you write or talk about a thing, the, and the, the firmer that gets in your mind, the more easier it is to explain, the better it is, uh, the more of a subject matter expert you seem. And generally speaking, employers like and promote and encourage that. And, if, and a lot of people won't do it. So if you can make that kind of, um, if you can distinguish yourself in that kind of way, that will I mean, also help build the case for you being able to be allowed to work remotely. Also, speak at conferences, both local and national. Uh, find local, um, like local user groups, like the IGDA is that I mean, I've spoken at um, uh, several times before, and that, that's an excellent resource. Just building up that kind of portfolio as a public-facing subject matter expert is yet another reason to be able to be granted the privilege to I mean, work off-site. And as I said earlier, practice your telepresence while you're on site and find out how to be a visible contributor, not just walking around, not just in meetings, but also like, in, like inside your actual tool set, uh, like, like inside whatever tools you use where the other developers are going to be able to see your contributions. You need to learn to communicate that openly and clearly so it's obvious that whether or not you're physically on site, they know where to look to see that you're getting things done and that is concretely provable. And this will make your request to work from home a much easier thing to say yes to. And this is something that should begin realistically three to six months before you really want to target doing that. Again, consistency and predictability is key here. So how to ask. First off, just ask your employer about their work from home policy and how flexible they are on that. This varies wildly. Some places are really, ain't really open to it. Some places are very resistant to it. Uh, every, uh, the campaign for you know, proving yourself to be more reliable, practicing your telepresence, all those things will get you a little bit closer to a yes in environments where they're not necessarily going to be amenable to um, letting you just go off and work from home. It's, uh, it's an extended buttering up period, essentially. So, um, if, so if you're pitching, here's how I could work from home. It's incredibly important to clearly define what performing to expectations means. because so you have to have goalposts that are concrete, provable, that you can prove that you have crossed in order to map out progress over time. So let's say um, I will, like, I'd like to work at, from home one day per week to start. Here is how much productivity is expected of me, like, uh, you know, like this amount of work or this amount of output or whatever, some sort of concrete metric that you can point to and, uh, and refer back to historically. So at the end of, let's say, a three-month review period of working one day from home, you can say, look, I, I kept my promise. I maintained this consistent level of production over this amount of time based on our these agreed upon parameters that we negotiate in advance if you feel this is going well based on this uh, like based on this review could I do two days per week and figure and at that point the negotiations move forward it'll be a little bit easier to I need to ask for more and again every everyone's case is unique but this is at the very least a starting point for finding out I mean, whether or not you can do that in your organization then you can you know plan accordingly and again, always be consistent, predictable, and dependable. As a manager, you don't want to have to worry, is this going to be a productive day for them working from home, or is it going to be a nothing day? Have they done nothing but post cat pictures on Twitter all day, or, or am I getting, uh, or have 150 emails of all the change lists they checked in this afternoon? Never, never make them wonder. Just The less they have to actively think about you, the better, because they know what you can produce, they know where to look for it. It's a, a part of their day-to-day -day already, and you're not something they have to actively follow up with or, or be concerned with because you're everywhere they're looking. And also, <laughs> don't be sneaky. Uh, anything except for full honesty will ruin this opportunity and it will ruin the working relationship. I, um, I was in a situation once where uh, one of my developers was secretly trying to work from home because he moved too far away to commute. So a piecemeal, he would borrow equipment and work from home and say, oh, I have a doctor's appointment. Can I just work for the rest of the day from home? To the point where he, was, he just thought that he could stop coming in one day and say, oh, well, I've already borrowed all this equipment. I don't really need to come in ever again, do I? No, that was not the case. And that that permanently ended his opportunity of working from home pretty much ever again because he was not open and honest about it. Although I admit it was kind of comical the way he went about it. So scenario two, the freelancer life. I'm not looking to be tied down right now. 
So the sad truth is freelancing is really hard. You'll spend at least 50% of your time doing business development. You like in, in your heart of hearts, you're thinking you're going to be sitting at home with your, I know, with your, I know, with your Cintiq or I know, with your laptop, kicking up and I know, kicking your feet up in your favorite chair and just, I know, just, you know, rocking out, doing really cool stuff all the time. No, a lot of this is going to be emailing people, asking for work, following up, uh, trying to collect and uh, collect on payments. Um, uh, filling out tons and tons of paperwork, f uh, having a legal contact sometimes, having to do your own uh, taxes or pay a tax professional to do them. It is really, really annoying. It's only, only half of it is what you think. It is absolutely not for everybody. It's and because there are a lot of, um, so if you're working in a studio, all of these things are taken care of for you. Uh, so it, you'll begin to immediately appreciate what admin, legal, finance, and biz dev departments really do for you. They, they, they oil the gears that keep the engine running. When you go out and freelance on your own, all of that is up to you. And it, you become painfully aware of, oh wow, this is literally everything but my direct job was taken care of for me. This is a lot more. And a lot of people don't really last beyond the first six months to one year of freelancing because it's a splash of cold water. And it can be really fun when it's at its best, but just know there's 50% of it is going to be fairly unpleasant unless you just love signing NDAs and forms and chasing people down for payments. So where do I start? So first, I mean, if you're going the freelance route, find out what kind of side work your employer permits, if any. If they don't, don't freelance. Don't find yourself in a situation where your current employer could technically legally own uh, the content you're creating for whatever client you have on the side. That is ugly, that's messy, that will blacklist you as a freelancer and always stay on the right side of whatever, uh, whatever contracts you have signed uh, and abide by. Just don't, do not mess around with that. Uh, one, uh, so if they do not allow side work, you can uh, start yet another campaign uh, to break out on your own and start gathering clients. So be prolific, publish, broadcast your work. Start months before you want to go full-time remote. Think of it as a marketing campaign. So if you're an artist, be on ArtStation, be on CG Talk, be on PolyCount. Enter every contest. Uh, whenever other people are entering contests, comment on their work. Uh, it doesn't have to be 100% self-promotion, but if you can make yourself a part of the communities in which uh, the active freelancers um, and, and other subject matter experts alongside you see you as a regular fixture, that is, and that you can be a normal part of that consistently over time and consistently produce good work, and it's not 100% self-promotion, that will make it much, more, uh, much easier for people to come to you, especially if you publish tutorials, if you give talks, and if you write about the craft and you get really involved with other professionals. I am, let's see, I just signed my 50th project recently, and literally every single gig I have ever had on every title has been a result of a referral because I'd been socially active on, uh, like, in various uh, internet forums and, like, a poly count in particular, and because I write and publish. At a certain point, you, it, people start coming to you because you are there consistently and presently enough, and I cannot emphasize how important that uh, that aspect of it is you would be surprised once you really get that inertia going and most importantly never stop doing it once you start if you are only if you only show up when people uh, like when you need something from other people it's easy to write you off uh, just be be a part of the community because you want to be a part of the community not solely because you're trying to extract value from it people can tell so where to find clients if at all possible, never burn bridges and stay in touch with former employers. They are the greatest source of either uh, con either continuing work or references to other other studio heads or other studios that are looking for work. And I mean, just every anywhere like you know two, three, six months, just checking in with them, seeing if they have any needs or if they have um, or if they know of anybody that's looking, that can be an extremely valuable uh, source of potential revenue, like in perpetuity. Um, and if they if they say no. Always, always, always ask for a recommendation or a lead somewhere else. Every single no can be turned into an introduction. I've gotten incredible results from that. And also, along with rejection, you'll get used to a lot of rejection. And getting anything signed will take a minimum from the first email, uh, the, and the first e introduction email, to actually getting signed on, officially starting work. On average, 30 days is the fastest I've ever seen it happen. At, um, normally, it's about 45 days. So you'll have to be patient. You'll have to be uh, get used to hearing no a hell of a lot. And you have to get used to sending a lot of emails and following up 
constantly. Again, that's the less fun part of it, but when it works, it feels terrific. And, uh, also, and uh, alongside uh, sending emails, create an email template saying, hello, I'm offering my services, blah, blah, blah. Um, try and customize it for each person that you send it to because it's really obvious that, uh, that, it's a that it's a template. Always include a portfolio link. Don't ask too much of them, but just try and get on a regular and respectful cycle of how often you send that and who and keep track of that. Because if you, write, if you have to custom write it every time, you'll learn to hate it much more than is necessary. So try and save time and find ways to streamline and optimize that. So cutting the tether in five acts, preparation, discipline, security, marketing, and tenacity. So preparation, decide, are you going to be mobile or are you going to work from home? And by mobile, I mean working out of, if you're traveling everywhere, if you're working out of, um, like out of a co in coffee shops or co-working spaces, that is an ex that's a very different hardware setup than you would, uh, than you would have if you're working from home. Uh, you also need to buy all of your own equipment and you need to have a broad software proficiency. So, uh, if you're deciding whether to be mobile or to work from home, mobile is good for producers, project managers, and directors, and for people that do work that involves travel. Uh, and if you live in cool cities with lots of cafes and co-working spaces, if you can do most of your work off of a laptop uh, or, in, or a phone, you, and if you're traveling around a lot, you're not gonna wanna carry around 150 pounds uh, worth of everything all the time. So be realistic about the, uh, the power of your spine. Uh, work at home is good for artists or developers with serious hardware needs, for people developing for VR, and for parents that can work with minimal interruption. So the importance of buying your own equipment. So you're responsible ultimately for all, for all of your hardware. It's expensive, but it's worth it for many reasons. So first off, if you are contracting with a company, um, the, so if you're introducing yourself to a company that is not a former employer, if you have your own equipment, that is less of an equipment cost on them. And that's an immediate, basically an immediate savings as soon as you start talking to them. But in addition to that, if that contract ends either expectedly or unexpectedly, you don't have to give that hardware back because you provided everything for yourself. Find, suddenly finding you've grown relied upon this like a massively beeftacular PC that whatever client gave you and realizing, oh, I have to give this back. Now I need to, now I'm back to my old crappy PC that I didn't invest that much money into. It's not a very good feeling. So it's really deeply worthwhile to make sure that you have a consistent set of hardware that you can use for anything that is 100% yours that no one has any claim on but you. And really don't go cheap. But also don't think of this as uh, is the perfect time to massively overspend on every weird little gadget you ever thought that you would need. Because I've done that. I have a lot of things that do and do not go into my go bag. And over the course of time you realize, I actually did not need that, you know, $750 or whatever. Uh, buy things you need as you need them. Don't, I mean, don't skimp uh, unnecessarily, but just be realistic about what you really think you will be using on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, you'll waste a lot of money. And if you're, uh, if you're a mobile dev on the go, you're gonna be really destroying your back carrying around extra crud that you don't need. And you can also deduct all these things on your taxes, which is really, really nice. And uh, having a dedicated work machine is ideal. I'm very particular about partitioning, um, partitioning off uh, personal things, personal projects, and just like my, you know, my average day-to-day -day use PC with my work PC. The less commingling, the better, because when I'm at work, I'm at work. When I'm at home, I'm at home. And mixing the two is uh, the fast track to insanity. So broad software proficiency. You use whatever tools your clients use and never, ever, ever mix work and personal accounts. Always have your own unique accounts on say Google, Slack, Trello, Skype, Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, any professional tool that you use, create your own special dedicated work only account for that. Ideally with a work related email ad or a personal email address that is own, or sorry, a personal email address that you own that is only for business matters. Because I've been in many situations where um, my clients have given me an email address uh, and say, let's Trello, for example. I had not used that before uh, I had a particular client. And then when that contract ended, my login credentials were tied to that email address. So I lost that account, even though I had uh, many other uh, like personal Trello boards running off of that. I, and that caught me off guard and I realized, oh, that was a really stupid thing to do. This is an account that I will use for a lot of different things and all that should be run through my domain, through my email address, through my unique account. So whenever conceivably possible, have your own account for that and maintain control of it. It's the same principle as, uh, as owning all of your own hardware. 
you know what you have to use, you know what your capabilities are, and you know what you have access to at any given point, and no external force can take that away from you. And that builds a sense of confidence and, uh, and reliability, and just not having to worry about, you know, this contract ends, so I'm not gonna have access to this tool anymore. It's unnecessary mental overhead. Own all your own stuff, all your own accounts. And pay for and license all of your own software. Exactly the same principle. Um, a lot of the common tools that are used in remote work are Perforce, Jira, Basecamp, Trello, Handsoft, SVN. Gain at least a passive familiarity with these, um, even if it's just signing up for a trial account. Uh, just do whatever you can to, ha and to know enough about it to be able to jump in really quickly if you're asked, because every different Every different company has a completely different set of tools that they use, and the more familiar, uh, familiar you are with each of those, the better selling point that is. So if you're the person that has at least a little bit of knowledge about absolutely everything, it's a lot easier to work your way toward a, yes, we'll sign you on, let's have you start working remotely. Discipline. So, uh, ubiquity, workspace, responsiveness, and disaster readiness. So ubiquity. Use the services your clients use. As I said before, oh, you use this app? I'm already on it. Here's my work account info. Here, uh, here invite me into your GitHub repo. Integrate with the team and the tools where they work and never ever ask a client to sign up for anything. You have to adapt to them and whatever they are using and it is up to you to be a, a, tools, uh, a tools expert and to be extremely adaptable to whatever they happen to throw at you. Because you will see everything and you never want to be caught out of your depth. And inevitably, you will be, but if you act confident about it and you've done at least a bit of preparation working with these tools, it's much more likely you'll present yourself as confident to the client and then you're, uh, or prospective client, and you're that much closer to a yes and that much closer to retaining them as a client. So you have to establish a powerful, reliable remote presence to build their trust in you, and the best possible place to do that is inside the tools where they already exist and already work. Slack has been a boon in the past couple of years for me because it's, it's IRC for work. It's, I mean, people, I mean, people chat in all the day. They have, you know, the random channels, but they have the, um, the discipline-specific channels for art production, for AI, for programming, for level design, for general discussion. That's where if organizations that use Slack well and correctly are really easy to, like, to work your way into because you can be physically present, I mean, well, virtually present in all the chats that they have. And in that particular interface, you are no different from anybody that's working inside the, inside the four walls of that studio. That is the most, in the most even ground you're possible I mean, to have with them and you need to take maximum advantage of that. Don't goof off all the time, I mean, but just make sure that you're there and present and, um, and that your name, uh, it's actually this is a little, um, a little trick I learned recently. Make sure that your username in Slack follows the same naming conventions as everybody else in Slack for if they're tagging their name. So if it's a first initial last name or just first name, make your name that so they can tag you just as easily as anybody else at the studio and you're that much easier to contact and, uh, and tag in the conversations and you're just a little bit more integrated with everything they do. The less friction there is with dealing with you and talking to you externally, the easier you are to work with, the more likely you are to retain them as a client. Any tiny advantage you can find, you should take it. So your workspace. Set aside a dedicated workspace and do not work and play in the same area. Because ultimately that's purgatory. You're never completely at work, you're never completely at play. If you're trying to relax, you're gonna feel obligated to log in, you know, uh, like sync down latest Perforce build or I mean, catch up on emails or see, you know, what else you can do. And you'll feel a little bit guilty for not catching up on this or that. And conversely, if you're working in a place where you play, you're gonna be tempted to go on Reddit, to dink around on Twitter, to, I mean, do, I mean, to you know, play a game. It's, so you're never completely at work because you're always tempted to play. And it's, is a very strange place uh, to be. So that's why I recommend having a completely physically distinct separate place where, in which you work and you only work. Um, when I started my company, I was renting a 650 square foot apartment and the entire bedroom was my office. I had uh, a bed in my living room. Uh, they gave me, uh, you, can, uh, you can write off the amount of um, square footage on your taxes uh, for the space you worked in at your home, which was you know, really convenient. But more than anything, I only worked in that space and I worked primarily off a laptop. When I'm at work, I'm on the laptop in the room where I work and I'm focused on that. When I'm off work, I unplug, I unplug the laptop, I go into the living room and that is where I play. Never co-mingle. So it's, and having that physical, like physically different environment is really important. And that can also apply to um, a cafe, for example, or a co-working space. 
I mean, having your physical surroundings encouraging you to work and focus on whatever you need to do is really important. And if you start out doing that, you will avoid a lot of the issues that a lot of uh, first-time remote workers and freelancers would have otherwise. And, uh, remove attention distracting items from your workspace. It's like, um, like those, uh, those little physics balls where you, uh, you pull it back and then it clacks back and forth. Just any kind of weird tactile little uh, distracting thing like a Nintendo DS on your desk. Remove anything distracting and have it be a dedicated focused place for work because you're already having to compensate so much for your remote presence and force projecting yourself and practicing your telepresence that anything that can de uh, detract from that should just go away. And uh, establish work time boundaries with family. This is a big one I've seen a lot. You can't work remotely with constant distraction and mismanaging this weakens both work and family relationships. Like if, you're, if your kids are always running into the room and you're always you know, playing with them and you're getting distracted every five to 10 minutes, how you're not gonna be producing your most high quality work and you have to find a way to partition out your time so you're respecting your client, but also being the parent that you, ne you need to be. And this is unique for every person's situation, but the w work at home or, uh, parents, uh, this, is a, this is a very common thing that I hear. You need to learn to put up those boundaries because it's really, really convenient to go like, oh yeah, let's go play out in the backyard. Um, it's, it's something worth paying attention to. And also, if you say yes to every single contract and opportunity that comes your way, you'll quickly hate your life because you have no time for your family, you feel like you're always at work, and you'll begin to resent the entire institution of working remotely. And ultimately, everyone I know has made this mistake. They've overcommitted themselves and they've had to learn from that, sometimes painfully. But at a certain point, after about maybe a year or two, you know what you're capable of, you know how to manage your time between work and family, and you're not afraid to say no. Because it's natural if you're sending out you know, 100 emails a week trying to get somebody to say yes to you, saying no back can be a little bit daunting because you know the, the very, very low yield of yeses to nos that you get. But at a certain point for mental, uh, for mental health and time management and family, you really have to. Responsiveness. Always respond quickly and follow up when you say you will. Being able to make a commitment and then keep it, even if it's just saying, hey, I will call you at 2.15, if you can do that consistently, that is a massive confidence builder, uh, builder in your client. And just being able to say that you're going to do something and then not following up on it, they may not tell you that they were disappointed or they noticed. It's entirely possible they may not even notice at all, but, it's, but over a long enough period of time, your word is your bond, and if you're not able to meet even minimal, like minimally consistent things like that, it's going to be a much more difficult relationship working remotely and they're not going to be able to trust you to do what you're going to say you do for large things if you can't do it for small things. And always communicate in the channels that they expect, like in, uh, like in Slack or Perforce or whatever systems your, um, your particular client uses. And show up early and dress well for remote meetings. I learned a, um, a fairly embarrassing lesson when I was uh, working. Uh, so I worked with Epic Games for a year running the Unreal Engine Marketplace. And I worked on site in North Carolina for one week a month, but the rest of the time was in Brooklyn. And the very first meeting uh, video conference I had with Tim Sweeney from my home in Brooklyn, I was unfortunately wearing a tan shirt. So it looked like I showed up shirtless for a meeting with Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic. <laughs> That was a very humbling and instructive moment. Uh, so be aware of how things look on camera and try to try to dress it up a little bit. <laughs> oh, that still stings. <laughs> and, uh, and remote work on an ongoing basis is earned. When you're working on site, attendance means I see that seat is full. When you're working off site, attendance means they consistently respond to us quickly. And consistency and reliability, I keep pushing that as much as possible. It's, it's, the expectations are so different of on-site versus off-site, and this is one of the better examples I can think of it. Just always be responding quickly, even if you're not giving them necessarily the answer they want. Just being able to say, hey, I hear you. I'm in the middle of something else. I'll respond at this time. That is better than not saying anything and then responding two hours later with what they need. Just acknowledgement rather than fulfillment or delivery is key. Disaster readiness. So realistic scenarios to plan for are power outages, internet and cell, uh, cell service outages, hard drive crashes, stolen hard drive or laptop, a hospital or family emergency, or non-specific hardware failure. Find out, I mean, just plan out what you do in each of these cases. At home, do you have universal um, power supply? Is there, I mean, if you're working um, like off of a laptop and you work um, on a mobile basis, 
uh, where is the nearest internet cafe where you can get back online I mean, if your connectivity drops. If, uh, if you are working from home, your internet goes down and there is a critical delivery, do you have a cellular, uh, cellular modem? Um, Verizon has a, what's called the Jetpack, which is a pay-as-you-go cellular modem, uh, which is extremely convenient. It's a 4G LTE speeds. It is fairly expensive, um, uh, like on a pay-as-you-go basis, but if you absolutely need internet access and you have to make a delivery, that's a convenient thing to have in your back pocket. And you can, um, well, literally, they're very small. Um, you can get one for anywhere from $125 to $175, no contract, and then just pay as you go as you use the data. I have found that it's, so my clients know that I have that. I've only had to use it in a handful of cases, but it's always been kind of a nice bullet point to say, hey, here's my backup. Rarely used, but it's here if you need it. So sometimes a sale is made not uh, on, you could sell somebody on, like a service or a feature like that that is never really used, that's what leads to a yes, even if it's never actually exercised in practice. And that's just a nice thing to have around. Uh, for a hard drive crash, since you're responsible for your hardware, uh, do, do you do regular backups? Do you have um, like web-based backups? Like where are those files if things fail catastrophically on your side? Again, in I, like a, in your studio's IT, this is the kind of thing that's taken care of for you. This is now something that you're responsible for and have to plan for in advance. If your hard drive or laptop are stolen, uh, were they encrypted? Were they passworded? Can you, uh, can you track them remotely? Can you disable them? These are things you have to plan for. Uh, if there's a hospital or family emergency, it might help to have an email template um, set up in advance, uh, like in a draft folder to your bosses or whoever, I know, whoever would need to know if, uh, if you're out. So like as you're on your way to the hospital or something, you can pull out your phone, hit send on that draft, and then have that be essentially taken care of instead of people wondering where you are. Ultimately, they'll be understanding, but if emergencies like that happen, it's, it, it's a convenient thing to have, uh, to have in place so they can know and plan for it. So security. I've done, uh, I did another talk on this called uh, Tools and Tech of the Globetrotting Freelancer. I go into a lot of detail on this, and I will not do that today. But ultimately, encrypt your hard drives. Uh, like in Windows, use BitLocker. For Mac, use uh, FileVault. For USB drives, use uh, VeraCrypt. It's a fork of TrueCrypt. Uh, it's, it essentially creates an encrypted passworded container. So if, so, so if you lose a thumb drive or if someone steals it from you, they'll see just a big lump of a file they cannot open without the password. Never leave any client data up to chance. Treat it as though it's more valuable than your own. Uh, use a password manager. I like LastPass. Um, OnePass and KeePass are also very good. If you're using the internet today and you're not using a password manager with unique passwords for every website, you are using the internet wrong. And if, just very bluntly, you're using it wrong. And if you have your logins to your various client sites and you're not using unique passwords with them and you're not, uh, t and you're not taking care of all of that inside a password manager, you're putting your client's data at risk and you're being irresponsible. If, if for nothing else, use a password manager for your client's data. It's very little extra effort to do it for yourself, but think of your clients. Uh, two-factor authentication on everything. It's, uh, it's the same basis. Uh, so essentially, two-factor authentication is a way if you're, let's say you're logging into Google, it wants you to prove who you are who you say you are, and the easiest way to prove that is to send a message to your phone. So they'll do it either via SMS or by a constantly rotating code, saying, okay, enter these six digits to prove that you are you and you're in physical possession of your phone before uh, granting uh, access to your account. Dozens and dozens of websites, especially bi uh, business-focused tools, um, offer two-factor authentication, and you should enable that for every single one of them, especially for your client. I mean, any, any login that you can find on a, a two, two factor off org. it's a comprehensive list of every service uh, that offers two-factor authentication. Sign up for every single one, especially your client sites, because frankly, my clients have never pressed me particularly hard on security, but it's one of the things that I, that I push forward showing I care about your data, I care about, uh, and I care about uh, your project, and I take, great, uh, I take extreme measures to make sure that your data is protected no matter what happens, whether it's, uh, whether it's a data breach, whether it's um, like a big password dump, whether my hardware is physically stolen, your data is safe, and these are the precautions that I take. Again, it's never really been something that a particular client has exercised, but it's part of my sales pitch, and it's appealing, and generally it's just good computer hygiene and you should do it. And also uh, use a virtual private network anytime you connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot that you do not own. 
because um, if, uh, so any non-HTTPS connection on a Wi-Fi hotspot, like here at GDC 17, that's visible in plain text. You can collect passwords, you can collect usernames, you can collect uh, every site the person has visited. I, um, like on my phone, I'm able to map out all the different devices that are connected to this Wi-Fi hotspot uh, for GDC, and there are over 2,500 of them. And dozens of your computers have, uh, like have your full names on them or your usernames. I was able to actually very easily find people online who are at GDC based on what they named their mobile, uh, mobile devices or laptops. And it would be trivial to, I mean, to snoop on their traffic using a virtual private network that encrypts all of your traffic when you're connected to uh, into a public Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi hotspot. And that also protects you and uh, protects your client. And anytime your connection is not encrypted with HTTPS and you're not connected to a Wi-Fi hotspot that you own or trust, you're putting all of that at risk. Uh, I recommend um, Air VPN, private internet access, or Weetopia for VPN. It's uh, anywhere from $2.99 to $4.99 a month. It's very cheap, very easy, works on mobile devices. And again, this is just decent data hygiene. So, marketing. You need a professional website, a LinkedIn, net, uh, and you need to be networking, and you need to um, be constantly engaged in publicity for yourself. So your professional website, if at all possible, use your real name or a new company name. It should be short, easy to remember, professional, and able to be spoken aloud in a way that people are able to easily understand get the .com or the .net. Uh, avoid weird top-level domains like .biz, .radio, .xxx, unless you're a very different kind of contractor. Uh, summarize your services using three to five bullet points. Ask friends for input. Um, WordPress is notoriously insecure, but if you're just having a very simple public-facing website, there are very simple, easy to use, easy to set up, free professional-looking themes uh, to present yourself professionally. And, you, and if you're providing professional services, you absolutely should have at least a website with your name on it that can prove you are who you say you are. Uh, also list prominent projects and employers, but only list roles where you did what you are selling. So LinkedIn, part one. Being on LinkedIn is not optional. It's the top business networking site in the world. It's the first place people with money will look you up. And if you don't have a LinkedIn presence, you look risky and unprofessional. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to be in the first place people with money will want, uh, and people with money to give to you will look to find out uh, if you are qualified to give money to. And that, like, that is essentially the beginning and the end of the argument for LinkedIn. Like, like be there, be professional, maintain it every, I mean, every few months. It takes very little effort, but it's absolutely important that you're on there. And polish up your presence. Update your roles and descriptions, spell check, use the proper tense, uh, present tense, past tense give and request recommendations. And this is an important one that I've, I've not really seen other people touch on before. Add projects and link to your coworkers on those projects. So let's say um, a game is shipped or, or there's a layoff. If you add those projects on LinkedIn and add your coworkers on LinkedIn, you're much easier to discover for potential work or uh, being hired as a team or for freelancing if you're associated with that. So if you're connected to, you know, five coworkers away, it's like, oh, this coworker is an engineer. Uh, who, who else are you working that with? Oh, I'm actually looking for artists, and they're able to find you through that path of discovery because you're associated with that project or with that event. It makes it a lot easier for good things to come to you. And if you were not already on LinkedIn and you weren't connected to their projects, they would never have found you otherwise. This is a very simple way to establish a passive presence. And part two, connect to your coworkers, not during a layoff. <laughs> it's, that's, that's when everybody realizes, oh crap, I haven't updated LinkedIn since I got this job. <laughs> and, uh, and that's actually a really easy way to, uh, to spot layoffs. When everybody from one company is connecting to each other all at once and it's flooding your LinkedIn feed with it, that's, um, I've discovered layoffs that way. Add them before you need it. Just, I mean, just uh, like as you meet someone and work with, I work them at, I mean, at work uh, or I mean, for a client, add them whenever, like at the earliest possible, um, earliest possible point, just before it seems like you're just trying to get something out of them. Also, connect to recruiters because this expands your network reach. It's easier for people to find you through recruiters who are naturally going to be connected to everybody on LinkedIn. This also passively increases your discoverability. Join relevant LinkedIn user groups. You can use a group affiliation is, um, is one of the reasons to connect to someone on LinkedIn when you send them a connection request. The more of those you have in common, the easier it is for you to reach people that may otherwise be unreachable. Get in the habit of cold emailing and introducing yourself. 
Do not be shy. Rip off the Band-Aid. You must be constantly communicating and networking. Don't stop doing it just because you, uh, you secured a client in the near term. Always, always, always be networking, be reaching out, and be practicing. And just follow general industry goings on with LinkedIn. Networking. Attend trade shows constantly. GDC is the highest value in my experience. Wink. Also, XDS, E3, Gamescom, PAX, Steam Dev Days. Look up and join local game dev user groups. Attend meetups, game jams, workshops, game nights, beer nights, drink ups, job fairs. Anywhere there are developers in your area. If you're working remotely, it's, it, can be, it can get really, really lonely, just, uh, just for one thing. But being able to go out and hang out with other developers uh, is just for, not just for you know, networking and potentially finding, uh, like finding work uh, locally. It's just good to be around other devs to remember what it's like and to be able to share war stories and to be able to feel part of the community. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's important for sanity. And always have business cards ready. I recommend uh, Zazzle and Moo. They have great quality cards, very good designs. I should put a referral code up there. Man, opportunity missed. So publicity. Publish articles in your area of focus. Publish on your site and cross-publish to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is desperate to be a publishing platform and they promote the hell out of anybody that uh, will publish something on their site. They'll promote that to the top of your feed to anybody you're connected to, which is yet another good reason to connect to people before you need them. Um, also apply to speak at industry events and local IGDA chapters are a great place to start. Publish original content frequently on your blog or on Gama Sutra uh, or on, again, LinkedIn. Do uh, Reddit AMA, do Twitter Q and A's, uh, be part of Screenshot Saturday if you're working on uh, cool stuff. Twitter is an amazing way to reach out to people. Uh, yeah, be, request guest spots on industry podcasts, get involved in that community. The more, the more broadly present you are in these communities, the easier it is to find you, the more likely it is you'll be able to find paying work. Tenacity, constant biz dev, taxes and expenses and cabin fever. This is the fun part. So constant biz dev. 40, at least 40 to 50% of your time will be doing biz dev. That's just the sad truth of it. And the sooner you can get used to that in, in automated or try and make it fun, the better. But that's just gonna be a part of your life from now on. Always be networking, always be selling, but don't be a dweeb about it. Just be like, hi, I, like, oh, hi it's nice to meet you. My name is such and such. I, like, do you have a job for me? Don't be that person. Be the person that's cool, that attends, that attends events, that people like hanging out with, and don't try and find a way to bring the conversation around to yourself. Be that presence and don't push for a result. And ultimately, good things will come to you, but also don't be too shy. It's, it's a balance, but it's, it's worth trying to find. And always remember, you work to secure next month's income, not this month's. So if you're getting paid this month, that's fantastic. Where's next month's coming from? Always be doing biz dev, always be pushing, always be trying. And when you're employed, all this is, is invisible to you. Respect your company's founders, admin, finance, legal, and IT. So in your, you're in customer service now. Retaining clients means ongoing customer service. And understand what doing a good job means on a per-client basis. They may define it differently. Be explicit because only their opinion matters. You may think you're knocking it absolutely out of the park, but their expectations are completely different and they may perceive, they may perceive you as being underperforming. That's why you have to go out of your way to reach out above and beyond what you would do if you're working on site. Find out if you actually are meeting their expectations and uh, find out if they actually are communicating those back to you. It is your responsibility to reach out and pull and get that information. And how to retain clients. Be responsive, aware, present, and always check in. Always be where they look first. Keep in touch with old clients. Manage your time wisely, don't get greedy. Like a shiny new gig is tempting, but serve your existing client well. Just be realistic about what you're realistically able to accomplish and don't take on too much too soon. People find this out over time. Everybody makes the mistake. Taxes and expenses, hooray, best slide. Work with an accountant from day one. Do everything they say. Remember, taxes are no longer withheld. You need to be saving at least half of whatever you bring in. Start a tax savings account for paying taxes and immediately deposit half of every check in that and do everything your, ta uh, your tax professional says from day one. This will lead to pain. Be smart, get a tax pro. Pay them to do the thing that you will undoubtedly hate doing. Also, be frugal and focus on savings. Plan for lean times, budget for disasters. Target six months of savings in the bank in case anything goes wrong. Not many people I know actually have that I and mean, have all that saved up uh, when they're starting out working remotely, but this is something worth, uh, worth moving toward, and that is something to aspire toward. And finally, cabin fever. A dedicated workspace, as I mentioned before, helps you focus. 
get plenty of exercise and sunlight. If all you do is stay inside all the time, eventually it'll turn into a pale, sickly little thing that is practically transparent. Uh, I've, I had a, a two or three month stretch where I realized I was starting to resemble an, a, like a mole rat that doesn't see the sun. My eyes were, well, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an unpleasant place to be and I have an extraordinarily patient wife that would sponge me off. <laughs> so create healthy, oh man, I said that. <laughs> create, create healthy daily rituals. Do yoga, walk your dog, cook for yourself, take language lessons, develop a new hobby. Do something that is not your job to expand yourself, expand your horizons, and, uh, and to be able to mentally switch focus to something completely different. It's really important to maintain a well-rounded, well-balanced life, because otherwise work can become your life and you have to force yourself away from it to be able to remember to be a human again, to have a third dimension to you instead of just that, like that sweaty pale thing that's at the computer all the time. And maintain a strict separation of work and life. Uh, if you let it, it can absolutely consume you all hours of the day and night. You really need to clamp down on that and, uh, and just be realistic about, you know, what do you value most in your life? Like yourself, your health, your family, your relationships, your career. Like there's, you know, that famous example. Has anyone on their deathbed ever said, I wish I spent more time at work? Just realistically, just be good, I mean, be good to yourself, be honest with what you really want and maintain that separation of work and life because it really can consume you if you're not careful. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions?